Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we'll be looking at table levitation. With me is Professor Stephen Browdy, who is an expert in macro psychokinesis, which is what we believe table levitation to, believe, to be. I believe that in any case. Stephen is the author of many books on parapsychology, including The Limits of Influence, a book about psychokinesis and the philosophy of science. He is also the author of Immortal Remains, a, a book examining the evidence for life after death. His other titles include Crimes of Reason, The Gold Leaf Lady, and ESP and Psychokinesis, as well as a book on multiple personality disorder called First Person Plural. Stephen is the uh, former chair of the philosophy department at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Welcome, Stephen. Thank you, Jeff. Good to be here. It's a pleasure to be with you. And table levitation is a fascinating uh, topic because there are, what, hundreds of reports. Uh, yes, and they seem to center and begin, really, in earnest around the heyday of the spiritualist movement in the middle of the 19th century. It would make sense because in, in those days people sat in their Victorian parlors with big, heavy, you know, wooden tables, and, and they're all sitting around the tables, so uh, uh, attempting to induce spiritualistic phenomenon, and uh, table levitations uh, would, to me, they would seem like a natural thing to occur in that setting. Well, I think it was a natural thing to occur in that setting. It was not only a form of entertainment in those days, it was uh, what seemed like, to many, a reasonable way of initiating communication with the dead. Mm -hmm. um, it was only later that people began to suspect that what might really be going on was that humans were psychokinetically causing the table to move. Yeah. And, and of course, I think it's fair to say that uh, table levitation affords many talented uh, fraudsters an opportunity to commit fraud. Of course, as with any macro PK phenomena, yeah. they need to be produced under the right kinds of conditions mm -hmm. to be uh, convincing and compelling. So we'll be reviewing this history, but I think it's useful for our viewers to appreciate that uh, your interest in uh, parapsychology was stimulated by a, a personal experience of table levitation. Yes, this is what corrupted me. Uh, <laughs> It was back in graduate school. In those days, I was a kind of, or fancied myself to be a kind of hard-nosed materialist. Not for any particularly good reason. It was just an intellectual conceit I was cultivating in those days. Mm -hmm. And one day, it was a slow day in Northampton, Massachusetts, and some friends stopped by and they said, let's play this game called Table Up. Um, they didn't know anything about parapsychology, just as I didn't. And they said this was a lot of fun, and when it worked, it was really cool. And so it was my apartment, it was my place, it was broad daylight, it was my table, and for three hours I watched the table. It didn't fully levitate, but it tilted up dramatically under our fingers. We could be standing next to the table and the table would rise under our fingers. No legs were pushing it up, no people were pulling it up. Mm -hmm. um, I doubt that there's any way I could describe this that would make it completely compelling to skeptics, but I can say my friends were not practical jokers, not even sure they had a sense of humor. Um, yeah. And if one of them left to go to the other room, the table still would tilt under our fingers, not in the direction that you would have expected if it had been manipulated physically by, by mm -hmm. one of us. So I didn't know what to make of it at the time. It just scared the hell out of me, and I put it out of mind until I got tenure. You found it frightening? Yes, because I didn't know what it was. I, do, do your friends find it frightening? No. They thought it was just a game. Yeah, that's how they... Well, there's it. another game that people often play, I was reading about recently, Light as a Feather, where yes. people try to lift another person. I've done that. Uh-huh. And, and the, the suggestion is that sometimes that person appears to be light as a feather. And, yes, they seem weightless. And, and so perhaps there's some psychokinesis involved in that game. I don't want to rule it out. I mean, mm -hmm. we don't really know, but um, 
If so, then I would say it conforms to my own experience of full table levitations that I've had since these days back in graduate You've school. You've made a point of researching uh, this type of phenomenon in, in terms of case study research. Well, I've gone after, I've wanted to study physical mediums of various kinds to see what they're up to. And in many of those cases, uh, table levitations are part of the repertoire. Mm -hmm. And uh, one medium I studied in Germany, Kai Muga, um, I wouldn't endorse all of his phenomena for reasons I've explored in various publications, but the table levitations I'm convinced are genuine, or at least many of them are. Mm -hmm. And some I have video recorded under infrared or under um, very low light with very sensitive cameras. Mm -hmm. But what strikes me about those is that when the table <coughs> rises under our fingers, it feels weightless, it feels buoyant. Mm -hmm. And I can compare that to the way the table feels when people seated around the table try to lift the table and raise it because yeah. then I'm aware of the force pushing the table up. Mm -hmm. When the table actually levitates, it doesn't feel pushed up, it feels like it's floating. In fact, sometimes people try to push it down and are unable to do so. Yeah, we didn't have that experience, but that is an often reported uh, experience among those who've witnessed table levitations. Mm -hmm. I can also tell you that with Kai, when I investigated him the last time in 2015, uh -huh. the table would be up for about 20 seconds, and it was swaying back and forth to the rhythm of the music that was playing at the time. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting that you should mention music, because the uh, table levitation phenomenon often occurs in a uh, seance-like sociological setting. And th those settings, going back to Victorian days and uh, England and in America, they often included music and singing and uh, a kind of uh, party-like atmosphere. Well, this was investigated <clears throat> considerably later in the 1970s and 80s by Ken Batchelder. Um, and what he concluded about his group sittings mm -hmm. was, first of all, that um, it was very helpful to keep one's mind off the phenomenon itself because mm -hmm. then there was too much invested in success or failure. Yeah. Better to distract people, keep their minds focused on other matters, keep the atmosphere light, tell jokes, maybe even to fraudulently initiate the phenomena to uh, get people uh, to believe in the mm -hmm. reality of it ahead of time so that that would stimulate the production of genuine To phenomena. prime the pump, yes, so to exactly speak. Yes, exactly right. Yeah. Which, which would be an old shamanistic trick. Yes. Uh, I think William James even reported once, mm -hmm. I forget exactly what the story is, he uh, s s simulated the beating of a frog's well, that, that was not priming the pump. That, that was an example where he admitted he committed fraud. Oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah, yeah. Take he, that back. He, he, he was giving a lecture on physiology, and he had a uh, a heart he was showing to his students that was okay. supposed to be beating, as I recall, and it wasn't. So he he took a straw or, or, or something and poked at it to make it appear as as if it was beating when it I wasn't. I retract that example. Yeah, yeah. It was, but, but he admitted it later on. He said, "I committed uh, academic fraud <laughs> for the benefit." of my students. Right. But what Bachelor found, mm -hmm. and others I think have found similar things, that yeah. um, once you get people focused in the right way on what's going on to get them to believe in the reality of the phenomena, what really matters is the belief in the possibility of the phenomena. Right. And sometimes priming the pump will do mm -hmm. that. And of course we have all the sheep-goat literature that suggests that when people believe, the, uh, they get better results. Yes, and Batzeldor also noticed that sometimes natural sounds occurring while waiting for the table to rise, like thermal changes causing noises in the table, um, might get people to believe that, or just muscular movements, real muscular movements on the table, mm -hmm. might get people to think that something psychokinetic is happening, and that might cause something genuinely psychokinetic mm -hmm. to happen. Well, along with table levitations, we often get table rapping, where you get communication of some sort going on. Well, one case that uh, gave examples of not only rapping, but uh, table movements, dramatic table movements, was the Philip case mm -hmm. in uh, Toronto back in the 70s, 
This was a case of apparently PK by committee. Mm -hmm. uh, members of the Toronto Society for Psychical Research wanted to investigate the kind of phenomena reported in mediumistic circles. They invented a character named Philip. They gave him an elaborate history, concocted a, uh, this dramatic story around his life. The people involved in this experiment really embraced the story. They absorbed it. They basked in it for some time, mm. and then they tried to communicate with Philip and got uh, ostensible communications from Philip, including wrappings in the table and table movements corresponding to the, the wrappings. Mm -hmm. And they would ask questions, and the wrappings on the table would uh, be in response to their questions. Not only that, but they would be in proper response to the amount of knowledge that the participants had about the story they concocted about Philip. Mm -hmm. So if the question they asked Philip didn't have a clear answer in the history that they'd concocted, they didn't get a clear answer in the table. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so that would be an, a, an example that suggests that this is not necessarily a, a spiritual or spiritualistic uh, phenomenon but, uh, that is not produced by external spiritual agencies. But, but by the people sitting at the table themselves. Yes, I have to say for those survivalists watching that uh, it doesn't rule out the possibility of mm -hmm. uh, spirit influence, but it certainly doesn't make the case for it either. No, no, well, no, I suppose you could argue that, well, some other spirit came by and decided to impersonate Philip. Um, yeah, but there's no independent support for that conjecture. Of course, right? yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, I think it's fair to let our viewers know that in your analysis of the uh, spiritualistic literature in your book, Immortal Remains, uh, you, you say that there's still a lot of uh, weight to be given to the living agent psi uh, interpretation of these phenomena. Uh, yeah, I mean, to this day I'd say, at least on some days, uh, I still regard it as a kind of toss-up whether we've got evidence for living agent psychokinesis uh, or psychic functioning or evidence of survival. Mm -hmm. um, some days I think the scales tilt slightly in favor of survival, but it's a difficult case to make one way yeah. or the other. So with table levitation, uh, it could go either way. Well, except there's, in most cases of table levitation, there's no real evidence favoring psi. I mean, there's, there's not really... S survival, I mean, survival. Side, I mean yeah. yeah. Um, there's not much evidence given in cases of table levitation. It's just dramatic. Uh huh. And, and, and what you, if I understand you correctly, what you mean is independent evidence of uh, accurate uh, information obtained uh, by the medium. Correct. Yes. Th that would suggest that there really was a uh, discarnate entity in the room. Right. There's no. There's very seldom evidence of that kind in cases of table levitation. It's just dramatic, and mm -hmm. uh, it's ostensibly produced by a spirit. Yeah, and uh, maybe in another hundred years of research, we'll have a better idea about that. Uh, who knows? <laughs> The phenomenon, though, has been investigated very systematically by a number of people, and yeah. there's great documentary evidence of table levitations. Hundreds of photographs. Yes, wonderful photographs. Mm -hmm. And in many cases, these were done in exactly the right way. One case was by T. Glenn Hamilton in Canada in the early 20th century. Um, one thing he did was to place a, a plaque, a uh, photoluminescent plaque mm -hmm. on, a, on a table, so that when he charged it and the lights were turned out, you could see when the table was rising. Ah. And he had a bank of cameras focused on that part of the room. Mm -hmm. So when they knew the table was rising, he would trigger the cameras to go off. And there were some very dramatic shots he got of table mm -hmm. levitations. And the best part is the expressions of the people who were being yes. hit by the flying table. I know that you can see the shock on their yes, faces. Right. Well, You've made a real study of the methodology used uh, in the uh, late 19th, early 20th century when so many of these cases were being observed. And as I recall, one of the conclusions that you've drawn is that uh, the researchers involved, even though this was generally speaking in an era prior to the use of statistics and double-blind experiments, uh, but they had very rigorous protocols nonetheless. They did. One of the best was by Sven Turk in Scandinavia. Um, he did everything the right way. Mm -hmm. He had massive tables. 
Um, he had luminescent strips on the legs of the table. He had luminescent strips on the legs of the chairs seated around the table. He had luminescent strips on the foreheads of all the people seated around the table. Mm -hmm. So again, when they were charged and the lights were off, it was always clear where everybody was. And then when objects started to move, whether it was a chair or a table, uh, he would sh trigger the cameras and he got some very dramatic shots from multiple angles of large objects flying around the room. And again, the expressions of the participants are really the best part of the photos. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, skeptics, I suppose, are going to say, yeah, there must have been fraud somehow. Even parapsychologists, uh, such as our good friend Ed May, says you can't rule out fraud in these early case studies. You can't rule out fraud in any experiment. But mm -hmm. I think the real question is whether the evidence of an honestly conducted experiment uh, outweighs the evidence for fraud. And in these cases, uh, it clearly does. Well, and I know you've made a very careful analysis of, of that, but let's look at one feature. You mentioned the uh, lights and, and the darkness of the room. Many mediums insist the room has to be dark in order for them to produce phenomena, but others such as the famous uh, D.D. Home, uh, produced the same phenomena in uh, broad daylight. Well, Hume was an exception in that respect. It's clear that um, light doesn't necessarily inhibit the phenomena, but when you're dealing with ordinary people and not gifted mediums, uh, I think Batchelor had it right about this. Mm -hmm. What matters is belief, and what darkness does is to make a difference to the optics of the situation. Mm -hmm. So when you're not, when you're bathed in darkness, uh, you're not confronted with the kinds of physical evidence that might lead you to think, well, this po couldn't possibly happen. Mm -hmm. In the dark, you could think, or more likely to think perhaps, mm -hmm. that anything can happen. Mm -hmm. So it makes a difference to what you think is possible, and what you think is possible may be conducive to unusual things occurring. Now, you've done some uh, case studies of, of your own recently. I've studied a guy in Argentina named Ariel Farias. Mm -hmm. um, great thing about Ariel is that he doesn't require darkness. Uh, he's a regular guy. Again, like the best psychic subjects, he's not interested in being uh, a psychic guru. Mm -hmm. He's a regular family man. Uh, he's got a good day job. He's just interested in uh, understanding what's going on. He's opposed, as far as I can tell, to the spirit hypothesis mm -hmm. of what's happening. But he found, to his surprise, that he's able to make tables rise by touching them lightly uh, at the close end of the table. Mm -hmm. And we've got some very good video of the table rising under Ariel. Mm -hmm. What's also interesting is that the table legs and Ariel himself are placed on strain gauges so the changes in weight can be measured. And the table leg closest to Ariel is on a strain gauge. So even when the table hasn't yet levitated, Ariel can see from the strain gauge that the table is getting lighter. Mm. So he, he likes that kind of feedback. Mm -hmm. And that tells him that he's on the right track. He feels that when he puts his hand on the table, uh, he feels as if his hand is merging with that of the table. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, his hands and forearms get quite cold mm -hmm. when all this happens. And I should mention they're not sticky. Yeah. A uh, recent report on Ariel's phenomena has been published in the Journal of Scientific Exploration. Mm -hmm. of, of which I should mention you were the editor. Uh, yes, yeah, so it's not just a sleazy plug, it's an interesting paper. <laughs> yeah. No, it's a wonderful journal. Well, I accept that wholeheartedly. Thank you. <laughs> so, the the phenomenon that Ariel produces in Argentina are, is it done in a kind of mediumistic setting? It was originally. Um, the folks at the um, Buenos Aires Institute for Parapsychology, Alejandro Parra's group, um, had organized a kind of spiritist sitter group mm -hmm. modeled after the Bachelor sitter groups, yeah. and they were getting some dramatic table movements and which many of them interpreted spiritistically. Mm -hmm. um, now, Bacheldor himself did not, as no. I understand it. He basically felt that the uh, seances conveyed uh, a psi conducive condition Correct. that enabled the participants to exhibit psychokinesis. Correct. Um, but this so-called red light sitter group mm -hmm. did think that, or many of the participants did uh, favor, on the whole, the spirit hypothesis. Not mm -hmm. Ariel, however. 
But they found out by a process of illumination that the table only rose when Ariel was seated at the table. Mm. And then they discovered that Ariel could do this on his own. Mm -hmm. So Ariel has very cooperatively spent several years just exploring his own ability to make the table go up. Mm -hmm. um, he hasn't gone much further with it. I should also mention that Ariel's connection with PK phenomena began early on in his early teens mm -hmm. in some poltergeist-like incidents. Uh, connected initially with the death of his father, uh -huh. but continuing later in life. So even today, when Ariel gets agitated, things will fly off shelves. Interesting. So he's got that connection mm -hmm. uh, with PK phenomena that some of the, the great psychics have, too. Well, it's, it's interesting when we talk about table levitations. They are, are initially occurred largely in the spiritualistic settings. People, by and large, thought it's either fraud or it's the work of the spirits. Uh, but these days now we have so many other examples of spoon bending and right. other forms of uh, polar game psychokinesis. Right. Uh, I mean, it's it's not uncommon for people to uh, consider that they might actually have this ability themselves. It doesn't require a spirit. Whereas at one time, I I suppose the idea that a, a human being could perform psychokinesis certainly back in the 19th century, was almost out of the question. Right. It took a while for the, the idea that humans might be uh, involved in this to, mm -hmm. to gain some a foothold. Yeah. Uh, but now, the only limiting factor, I think, is one's capacity to tolerate uh, abuse from those who are skeptical. Mm -hmm. Or abuse from those who are so wedded to the spiritistic hypothesis right, right, that, that they consider you an enemy. Uh, yeah, well, I have some of those, right. I, yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm aware of that. <laughs> and um, my own point of view, for the benefit of our viewers who might be curious, is that we just don't know enough yet. Yes, I think that's fair. We need to we need to keep an open mind to various hypotheses at at this point in the game. Yes, I think our knowledge is still at a very early stage. And and my suspicion is that uh, if if we could pursue the, these studies uh, intensively for uh, enough time to really impact the culture, let's say several hundred years, it, it's likely that we're going to see more and more phenomena of this sort occur. Well, not surprisingly, you, there's evidence that phenomena, large-scale PK-like phenomena occur more readily in cultures where um, that type of phenomenon is not um, contrary to the prevailing belief system of the culture. Mm -hmm. Or so frightening that uh, people uh, institute all sorts of mechanisms to suppress it. Well, in some cultures it may re be regarded as frightening, but uh, people erect their own psychic defenses against it. Well, sure. And, and I mean, the belief in black magic exactly. and witchcraft is, is pretty prevalent, but in Western culture, we burn those witches at the stake. Right, and I, as we've discussed in the past, that's, mm -hmm. I think, one of the main reasons for the intense resistance to uh, the mere study of these kinds of large-scale PK events. Yeah, yeah, I, I, would, I would say so. But table levitation is particularly intriguing. Uh, it is. You can do it at home. You can. It doesn't require special equipment. I wouldn't recommend starting out with heavy tables, though, mm -hmm. because, again, um, we are dealing with our primary source of resistance, which is our um, culturally uh, inherited belief about what's possible and what's impossible. Yeah. And we're more likely to think that PK could lift a lighter table than a heavy table. Well, when you got together with your friends uh, when you were a student and uh, played the game, what did you call table it? Table Up. Table Up. Uh, was that a, a lightweight table? It was a lightweight. It was a folding table that sure. I had. So that might be a perfectly good way for people to start. Yeah, I wouldn't recommend starting with a heavy table. And, and there, I can say from my own experience, I don't recommend that people cultivate PK at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, from your experience with Ted Owen, that yeah. makes sense. Yeah, but but I think any, anybody is susceptible to potentially misusing it. it it's really an extraordinary ability, and uh, there may be a good reason why it's largely been suppressed in, in the human population. I do recommend that people study it, that they uh, are aware of uh, what's possible and what has been observed. But 
I, I don't think it's necessarily a direction that we want to encourage people to uh, cultivate. Well, I'm inclined to think it's innocuous so long as we're doing it in the context of group sittings and mm -hmm. making it into something like a party game, like table up. Uh -huh. um, it's not quite the same as training people to be wizards where you can stop their your fellow's heartbeat. Yeah. Well, I, su I suppose not, but I, my, my concern, for what it's worth, and probably worth very little, is that if a person develops some real skill, like Ariel, at table levitation, and someday he gets really mad at somebody, perhaps for perfectly good reason, he might uh, allow that psychokinetic ability to uh, manifest in a way he would later regret. Yeah, it's hard to know. I don't know mm -hmm. how, what the re relationship is here between one's conscious application of yeah. psi and one's unconscious application. Well, I did an interview recently, and yeah, I'll just mention it briefly, sure. with a fellow named Lynn Buchanan, mm -hmm. who, who deals exactly with uh, that sort of thing. So, uh, for our viewers who who want to dig a little deeper, that would be a good place right. uh, to start. And or uh, the interview I did with you earlier on poltergeist phenomena. Oh yes, <laughs> <laughs> it can be quite disturbing at, at at times. It's uh, one of the reasons I think maybe it's it's people who want to cultivate psi abilities might wish to start elsewhere. Well, but the genie's out of the bottle already. So. <laughs> Stephen Browdy, once again, thank you so much for being with me. Thank you, Jeff. It's been a pleasure. And thank you for being with us.